Hello, Tabernacle family. It's great to be with you again on another midweek message coming really in the holiday season here. Hopefully everybody had a marvelous Christmas and uh, New Year's is right around the corner here. So uh, may you celebrate the new year to the glory of God. It's a, it's a time of beginnings and we are beginning as well the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, so go ahead and turn there and I'll give you really just one announcement while you're on your way uh, over there. Uh, and that is that would you please consider beginning the year in prayer with us? And I know uh, many of you who faithfully are following us for these midweek messages uh, are not yet comfortable coming back into the house of God, and yet we understand that we serve an omnipresent God, and so uh, please pray with us wherever you may be. And Thank you for your faithfulness and, and sticking with us through this. Uh, for those of you who are uh, looking to come in person, that's uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, just from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the morning. And the thought is, uh, before you're kind of up and running and off to work, would you please stop in? We'll have uh, the sanctuary sanctified. And so that's going to just be the place where everybody's praying. Uh, we'll also have some refreshments, things of that nature. That'll be over in the gym and kitchen area right there. And obviously wear a mask, do the whole uh, protocols for all of that stuff. Uh, but please come and be with us and take that time. Even if you can't stay for the whole hour, stop in, pray with us, pray by yourself, pray with the group. There's a lot of varieties here, but we're just trying to create a space, a context, uh, in which you would be able to cry out to the Lord your God. Bring your Bible with you, spend some time in the Word, uh, and maybe start this year off dedicated to the Lord God Almighty. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, hopefully all three days, if you can't, just at least one of those days, and uh, that we'd be able to start together, unified in prayer, uh, to the one who hears our prayers. So. With that being said, uh, I greatly enjoyed our study in the book of James. Uh, perhaps you did as well. James is kind of the Proverbs of the New Testament, and so uh, it was wonderful just to see all that wisdom literature as it unfolded upon our lives. And uh, We really continue in that same vein as we're going through Ecclesiastes. This also is wisdom literature. Uh, and I, I think maybe, as I say Ecclesiastes, one of the first thoughts uh, in your mind uh, well, maybe one of unfamiliarity. Maybe you not, may not know the book very well, but but even if you have a passing knowledge of the book, maybe the thought comes to your mind, what are you doing? Like, why Ecclesiastes of all books? You know, why didn't you go to, oh, I don't know, Genesis for crying out loud, or Matthew. Uh, I, I think Ecclesiastes is just rich literature. Uh, I think that you will find your soul pointed to Jesus Christ, uh, though in indirect ways. So, for instance, you're not going to find, like, Zechariah, right? It's just about the Messiah or Malachi, you know. Uh, you're not going to find these direct uh, promises. You know, this is this is where the Messiah will be born, you know, says Micah, you know, in Bethlehem. Not quite like that, right? Uh, what you're going to find is a way of contrast. And so you'll, here we are in chapter 1. This will become uh, painfully obvious, you know, where there's a real contrast with what Jesus or Paul says and what's, uh, being used in Ecclesiastes. So that's that's a good way to direct our souls to Christ. Uh, uh, this this sort of uh, historical redemptive narrative, uh, which maybe is just a fancy way of saying, look at where the Bible begins in Genesis and look at where it ends in Revelation. And Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the keystone. He, he is the centerpiece of all of this. And as you go through Scripture, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, we're, we're finding more and more, and it builds. There's a cumulative nature to Scripture. That doesn't mean, uh, like a Muslim doctrine of abrogation, like, like the new invalidates the old. Rather, Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. And so what we're going to find is that things build upon each other. So I think that's going to be a really enjoyable way. Uh, I, I think that in our uh, current climate, in terms of philosophy, in terms of way of life, Ecclesiastes speaks so powerfully uh, already today in chapter 1. We're going to be introduced to this phrase, under the sun, more on that when we get to it. But, but it's this idea of, of life without God and uh, this secular perspective on life. Like, here's, here's everything that's in the world. Like how the New Testament uses that phrase, the world. 
you'll you'll see that. And so these are really powerful reasons, and you'll you'll come up with more as we go through. It's not an exhaustive list I've laid out for you, but there's a lot of reasons to study the book of Ecclesiastes. It points us to Christ. It exposes the futility of a secular worldview and, and, and much more. Uh, maybe briefly we should say, what's Ecclesiastes all about anyway? Uh, and just maybe orient you to the book a little bit. Uh, Ecclesiastes is hmm, maybe a little bit like the Gospel of John in this regard, <laughs> very different in a lot of other regards, in that uh, you have a writer, and you have a main subject, and it's pretty helpful not to confuse the two. So when we read John, we don't really read the Gospel of John to find out more about the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, John features upon occasion in the book that bears his name, but it's really a book about Jesus, isn't it? And we know that. And so when you come this this first person thing, I am the light of the world, uh, I am the door, I'm the good shepherd, all, all these statements, we know that's talking about Jesus. I and the Father are one, not John. So when we come to Ecclesiastes, you have a framework, and so the really the opening, uh, we'll call it a prologue, I guess, for lack of a better word, verses 1 through 11, and especially verses 1 and 2. And then you have an epilogue right there at the end of, of chapter 12 that's sort of a framework, a literary framework. So here's the writer. We don't know who he is. Uh, that's by design, by the way. And so it, it uh, the way in which the book is written, is a literary means of communicating the subject of which the author writes, namely hevel, that word uh, vanity, more on that in a moment. <laughs> uh, and so you have this, this writer, and then you have the subject uh, who really now, uh, the writer gets out of the way and allows the subject, Kohelet, uh, or, or Ecclesiastes in the Greek, or the preacher, the teacher, uh, to be able to speak. All right, so that's sort of how the book proceeds. Now, uh, let me discuss one more thing, and then we'll, we'll read the text and get to it. Namely, who is the main subject, right? Uh, and so I already gave you a couple things. If you were to read this in Hebrew, Kohelet, you, you might have heard that term before. Uh, this is the one who's speaking. It's the, the title by which he introduces himself. So Kohal uh, is an assembly, and so a Kohelet, uh, would be kind of a, a title. That's that's the assembler. That's the one who assembles groups. Actually, Solomon takes this title for himself uh, when he dedicates the temple. If you can find that uh, over in the historical section of the Old Testament, and uh, as he dedicates the temple, he is assembling the people together. So this assembler uh, is called the Ecclesiastes, hence the name of the book in Greek. So an Ecclesiastes, or a, a Kohelet, an assembler, uh, well, it depends on the nature of the assembly. So you, you sometimes hear this word, Kohelet, used when the people of Israel are assembled to go out to war. Uh, sometimes it's used when they're assembled in worship. If you're going to say that this is a religious assembly, then you'd translate that in English as the preacher. If you're going to say that it's a secular assembly, then you're going to translate it the teacher. Um, I suppose those are fine translations, but it's a nice broad word, right? If you're around church very often, you'll hear that the church is called the ecclesia uh, in the New Testament, and so the Ecclesiastes is the one who assembles the ecclesia. It has a lot to say to our church, to our ecclesia as well. So who is Kohelet? We don't know. Uh, a lot of people say that it's Solomon. Verse 1 would indicate a real proximity right there. So who's the son of David? Well, maybe it's Solomon. Maybe it's a, a son of David, how Jesus is a son of David, right? There's a lot of space with those generations. We don't know who Kohelet is. Um, I tend to land on the side that says he's probably Solomon. There's difficulties with that, though. Uh, really, the first two chapters have this kind of uh, monarchical sort of uh, kingly position. But after really getting to chapter 3 and following, you don't need to be a king to write all this stuff. But Anyway, I, I think it probably is Solomon because you have such a lived experience uh, that he talks about. And so probably Solomon does some, uh, he sows his wild oats, but probably comes back to, to a sincere faith at the end of his life. Uh, but again, it's not a hill that I'm going to die on. Um, maybe you would differ with me. Maybe you'll agree. <laughs> uh, both uh, conservative commentators you'll find on both sides of the perspective right here. So all that to say, we're, uh, we're halfway in 
to uh, my typical 20 minutes here, and I haven't read the text yet, so <laughs> let's read the text, and then we'll, we'll go. Hopefully that orients you to the book. Verse 1 of chapter 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. A lot of people put a break right there, and then 3 through 11 is its own thing. So today we'll go through all of it, but we'll see. What does a man gain by all his toil, at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, goes around to the north, round and round goes the wind. On its circuit, the wind returns. All the streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It's been done already in the ages before us. And there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Ooh, was that depressing for you? Was that was that hard to hear? <laughs> Here comes the first uh, verse. Really, we'll pick up in uh, verse 2. We think we've covered the author of verse 1. It says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all of vanity. That's um, a sadly narrow translation. It's about as good as we're going to get, though, because the Hebrew word hevel is just bigger and broader than all of our English words, right? Um, you would understand that. Let's say if we took that word in English, love, and we translated that back into Greek, uh, you, you may know that there's four Greek words for love. Well, what if uh, the Greek word you chose was eros? That might be a really good word, but that doesn't encompass all of what we mean by, by love. Or, or that word phileo, kind of that friendly love, or storge, family love. Like we, we would have a bigger meaning when we say that English word, love. Well, so it goes with translation. And when you hear that word hevel, uh, pick up 15 different English translations and read through them, and you'll see that there's a real wide range. Some translations say meaningless right here. Some say futility right here. Some talk about this merest of breath that it is. Uh, I remember my uh, Hebrew scholar uh, in seminary, he would always translate that word hevel as frustratingly enigmatic. But boy, try to render that uh, in, in the text. I mean, it's just really cumbersome, right? Frustratingly enigmatic, frustratingly enigmatic, says the preacher. All is frustratingly enigmatic. So that one's not going to win many prizes uh, just because of its, its verbiage, you know, but all of that comes into play. So if you, if you lean on the word a little bit, you, you have an idea of brevity. And now I want you to remember James. Now, well, we just talked through James, didn't we? And, and it says that, boy, life is so fleeting. Remember, what is your life? Is it not a mere vapor that appears for a little time and then it just it vanishes away? Vapor. That comes pretty close. Smoky. That comes really close to what hevel means. Well, what's smoky mean? And so a lot of the translators don't use that word, right? Smoky, smoky, life is smoky. Like, what are you talking about, right? Well, right. And, and so the whole book is kind of smoky. Well, what is hevel? Life is a little bit like oil. And, and try to grasp that in your hands and see how well you do at it. Well, the, hence comes verse 3, right? What does a man gain by all his toil at which he toils under the sun? Well, if life is like trying to grasp this oil, you can't. So now here you are working. And Enter into this postmodern world in which we live, in which everything is suspect, in which all of life under the sun, well, what's under the sun? 
Well, you go to Minnesota or you go to Maine, it's under the sun. Man, you go to the land down under, and what is it? It's under the sun. You take your turn, and the sun sets, and that's it. And you have all of life around you, and you look around, and if this life is all that there is, it's desperately depressing. I think uh, the French philosophers of the 1900s got this better than anybody else. And some of them just ended in this awful depression. You could talk about Sartre, you could talk about Camus, uh, you, you could talk about Derrida, you, you could talk about a lot of these guys, and they're just looking around. Well, if, if what we see is all that we can see, then life doesn't make sense. So here comes all these truth claims. And why do you make a truth claim? We've already come to the conclusion life does not make sense. So here you come with your meta narrative. Here you come with your big truth claim. And, and they would say, I'm suspicious of what you're saying. And it lives in the common parlance. And so here you come as a saint, as a Christian, and you say, well, this is what life's all about. And the person looks at you and says, I'm glad that works for you. Because what else can you say? Now, if you come through this passage and you hear, you're going to die and be forgotten. Because what else do you conclude from this? If this is all that there is, then your life is like the sun. It rises and it sets. Your life is like the water. It all flows into the sea and yet it is not full. How much money did you make this year? Was it enough? Your life is like the wind. Here it comes again. What do you have to show for all your windiness? Maybe a broken tree limb. That's life. And that's what these postmoderns are, are coming to conclude. Because all that they see is under the sun. You see something new? Already been done. Funny. Not even modern, but that which is so avant-garde. Postmodern. <laughs> is the very thing that Ecclesiastes is talking about. Not very new. Well, that, that makes life awfully hopeless. And if you are trying to live a life for gain, on the terms that this life has to offer, you will be crushed under the oblivion of the futility of the endeavor. But if you heard you're going to die and be forgotten, and rather than causing this deep depression, if it caused you to sort of crack a wry smile on your face, you're halfway to happiness. You're maybe realizing that that which is under the sun may only be part of the story. See, the way that the Bible unfolds, it's piece by piece, line upon line. And this really rightly understands the futility of the curse. Remember Genesis 3, man will work by the sweat of his brow. He'll toil. And so Ecclesiastes says, what do you gain from all the toil? But what if your shoulders weren't meant to bear the weight of the world? What if your shoulders were meant for abundance and mayhem? Life's unpredictable after all. What if you read Ecclesiastes with the full picture of the Bible in mind, and you realize that in this world, ah, maybe there's no gain, but maybe there's more to this world than simply that which is under the sun. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, but what if the words of the New Testament came to your mind? that if anyone is in Christ, he is a, maybe there is something new. Old things are passed away. In fact, all things are becoming new in Jesus Christ. You read this, and it ought to point you to Jesus Christ. Vanity of vanity, says Kohelet. Everything is just vanity under the sun. Well, right, First John says that, doesn't he? That this world is passing away. And that if you're living for this world, you're done. All that is in the world, the lusts and the pride, it's, it's just vain, isn't it? But the one who does the will of the Lord, he abides forever. So instead of this friendship with the world, which is enmity with God, what if you had a friendship with God? What if there was gain? What does it profit a man? Remember, Jesus says this, to gain the whole world, but to lose his own soul. You'll die. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? But in Christ, you can truly live. What if you internalized 
1 Corinthians 15, that beautiful chapter on the resurrection. And you came to understand that if there is no resurrection, you live under the sun. You're living right in Ecclesiastes here. But what if there is a resurrection? What if you are in Christ? Then you get to internalize 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, do all these things, right? Be steadfast, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Vanity of vanities, says Kohelet. But the Apostle Paul says, no, it's not. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Would you work for the Lord today? Ecclesiastes is so helpful and just bursting all the little bubbles of things, the idols, that you trust rather than Jesus Christ. Would you point your attention to Jesus Christ today?